Good evening. Welcome to another Bible study for Castaways on a Wednesday night. Uh, if, if you know me very well, then you know that for me to record a video on April 1st for public viewing, that that would present to me one of the biggest temptations of the year. It's April Fool's Day. Oh, how I wanted to do it. Orson Welles type War of the Worlds uh, production in a, in a uh, shelter somewhere. But because of the seriousness of our situation, I'll just stick with my original notes and the original plan of helping us to find ways in which we can grow in Christ even while we are in isolation. So let's start with prayer. All right, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege of studying your word. May you, oh Lord, bless this time that we would know you better, that we would understand you better, that we would grow in our love for you even more. And Lord, as a result also, may we grow in our love for one another. May we come to understand one another better. And Father, may you be pleased to use us as a light in our world. And Father, during these days of isolation, grant us what we need in order to grow in Christ, to become more like him. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we focused on the value of God's word while we are in isolation. We spent most of the time in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, looking at how the Bible teaches, reproves, corrects, and trains us in righteousness so that we'll be competent and equipped for everything that's good. Uh, I hope that you've been able to utilize at least one of the, the simple tools I gave you for studying the Bible. For example, doing word studies. I hope that you use the word faith or faithful and, and glean a lot of uh, valuable lessons and encouragements from God's word. This week, you could, if you want to do that again, you can grab your concordance and, and study the word prayer or pray. Uh, and that's going to be a huge topic with a lot of references. Maybe you want to Google it and, and refine that or restrict that a little bit to maybe the prayers of Jesus or uh, prayers of the apostles or something of that sort that would narrow it down a little bit. But what a wonderful topic to study for a week on the topic of prayer. If you're watching a YouTube video of your pastor during the middle of the week, then you're probably already pretty well convinced of the necessity of prayer. Uh, you probably are already also convinced of the value of prayer for a follower of Christ. I don't need to convince you of its necessity or value. I don't need to give a biblical defense of such. Instead, I want us to focus on developing a godly response when our prayers are unanswered. What do we do when God says no? When God doesn't answer? There are two basic directions that we could go with this question. I'm going to start with the most positive, just for a few moments, and then we're going to spend most of our time on a very difficult direction with this topic. But first, and most positively, when God doesn't answer your prayers, persevere. Persevere in prayer. Turn in your Bibles to the parable that Jesus taught about a widow that had been treated badly, and she sought justice from a judge that would not listen to her. You can try to find that parable in Luke chapter 18. So turn to Luke 18, and I'm going to read the first eight verses and the parable that Jesus taught about this widow. Luke 18, verse 1. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him, saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while, he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? 
This could be an extremely difficult parable to interpret, except for the fact that Luke tells us in verse 1 why Jesus was teaching this parable. Sometimes in the parables, we have to try to understand what is the main point, and it's difficult to interpret some of them. This would be an extremely difficult parable to interpret if Luke did not tell us right from the start what its purpose was. Look again at verse 1. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. Now, what makes this parable so difficult is who the unjust judge represents. Is God to be likened to an unjust judge? No. God is not an unjust judge. This is an example of a comparison by way of contrast. God is not unjust. The main point of the parable is not so much a study of God's character as it is, that, as Luke tells us, it is to encourage us to pray and not lose heart. We must persevere in prayer when God seems slow to answer because we know that God is just. We know that God will hear our prayers. We know that God will answer. We know that God will answer speedily. Don't give up. He is not unjust. When you're faced with a difficult situation, you must not give up. You must pray and keep praying. Listen, there are times that God delays his response to our prayers so that we will keep praying and so that we will not lose heart so that we will keep talking to God and not give in to doubt, so that we will turn away from our selfish desires and we will grow in our trust in his will. The time of waiting that God gives us before he answers, such as right now in this days of isolation and we're waiting for things to change and get back to some normalcy, these times of waiting that God gives us before he answers can be a, a very precious time of growth. Don't give up. Now, this is extremely personal to me right now because of my constant prayers for my brother Mark and his wife Janet. As you know, they, they, they're continuing to battle COVID-19. At the time of this recording, at least, Janet is doing great. But Mark is still struggling. He's struggling to regain his strength. His fever seems to have broken, and then it comes back, and it breaks, and it comes back. And it's a time of real struggle. He's still very weak. So this is very personal to me. Is God hearing my prayers? Is he hearing the prayers of people from all over the world that are praying for Mark? Yes. Absolutely. I must focus on the glory that God will receive through his delay in answering. I don't have to understand why uh, God is waiting to heal Mark. I don't have to understand why Mark is having to endure such a, a hard struggle with this sickness. I simply must trust God and keep praying. And if God has determined that this is the time and the means that he will use to take my brother to glory, then blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, I, I pray with everything within me that this is not the time and that he is simply going to use this to strengthen my brother's faith and to encourage people literally all over the world that are praying for him. I'm, I am praying that God will use this in that manner to bring him even more glory, that Mark will be able to respond to people in even a bigger way with the gospel than he ever has been able to because of this suffering. But I simply have to wait and trust God. But I am 100% convinced that God will be glorified through my brother's suffering. So I wait and I keep praying. Don't quit praying. 
Don't give up on God. He hears you, regardless of the suffering that you're going through or that a loved one of yours is going through. God hears your prayers. He is not silent. He is not ignoring you. He is not unjust. He's waiting. So persevere. Don't quit. Now, for the time remaining, I want to look into the reasons that God would say no. You see, God always answers prayer. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's wait. But sometimes God says no. Sometimes he, he hears your prayers and he deliberately and decisively says no. And I want us to look into the reasons why God would say no and the reason why he won't even listen to some people when they pray. Did you know that there are times that God does not hear prayer? Like me, some of you may have had a girlfriend in your past that used that horrible breakup line, it's not you, it's me. Well, there are times in our life when we must face that reality with God and we must be willing to and we must be willing to say to God, it's not you God, it's me. It's not your fault, it's mine. I know that you're not hearing my prayer, but it's not your fault. It's all me. And that's the second point of this Bible study. The first one is that we are to, when, when God doesn't answer or he doesn't seem to answer, we need to persevere in prayer. The second point is simply, it's not you, God, it's me. Let's start with the three verses in the book of James where we can see three reasons that God does not hear a person's prayer. So turn to the, in back, toward the back of your New Testament. Right after Hebrews, you know, we spent so much time in, in Hebrews. Uh, the next book is the book of James. We're not going to do that on Sunday mornings. I, it's not that long ago that I preached through James, but it is the next book right after Hebrews in your Bible. Hebrews, I mean, <laughs> James chapter 1. Let's first, the first reason that we have tonight that God doesn't hear us when, when people pray Look at verse 5 through 8 in James chapter 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man unstable in all his ways. And so the first reason that God may not hear a prayer is that the person doubts. Doubt is one of the sins that is damaging to our relationship with God. This form of doubt that James is referring to relates to the promises of God and comes on the heels of James's instruction about being joyful during trials, of understanding the blessing that trials can bring into your life. You know that God will use trials to strengthen your faith, to, to enable you to persevere more effectively. God has promised to increase your perseverance through trials. So when you're facing a trial, he says, pray. Go to him in prayer. Ask for wisdom with regard to your trial, and he will not disappoint. Now, sometimes this passage has been pulled out of context. But I want us to see that this passage is, is relating to our dealing with our trials. That when we're going through difficulty and we need to understand why we're enduring, why we're going through this and how can we endure, we need wisdom. Pray and don't doubt. God will hear your prayer. Doubt causes discouragement. Well, it's a lack of faith. God says, trust me, I hear your prayer, and I will answer. There's no reason to doubt God and hinder your prayers. Now let's go to James chapter 4 and see two more hindrances. James 4, ooh, I just licked my finger. Don't do that. But they're washed. They're clean. <laughs> Old habits, right? James chapter 4, first two verses. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. 
You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. James is giving us instruction as to how to resolve conflicts that we have with one another. Who doesn't want peace in their relationships? We all do. And so when you're in conflict with a friend or a family member and, and God doesn't seem to be providing peace, maybe it's because you're not asking him. We can get so wrapped up in our need to be right, to be in charge and in control, that we sacrifice what is better. Our relationship with our brother or sister in Christ. We have conflict and strife, sometimes simply because we don't ask for peace. Now that's very basic. But James says this so that he can make a more important point in verse 3. And that's the third reason our prayers are hindered. One, we doubt. Two, we don't ask. And three, in verse 3 of chapter 4, he says, you ask and you don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Ah, now we're getting to the real problem, the real heart of the issue. It's not you, God. It's all me. My heart is the problem. My selfish desires, my worldly passions, my hidden motives or agendas hinder my prayers because I pray selfishly. I don't pray according to his will. I want what I want. Sometimes we may even be praying for something that is good, like my brother's healing, for example. But we can still be praying with selfish motives. So how do we protect ourselves from such self-centered praying and instead praying according to God's will and for his glory? Well, simply, you have to know God's word. You have to abide in it. And so next, our prayers are hindered, fourthly, when they are contrary to God's revealed will. Turn to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs 28, in verse 9. Solomon says, if one turns away his ear from hearing the law, that's a reference to the word of God. When someone, if, if one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. That is such strong words, isn't it? In a culture that is so easily offended, this is a powerful statement. If you hear God's word and turn your back on it, if you willfully neglect God's commands, your prayer becomes an abomination to God. Now, this is very similar to what the writer says, and it makes more sense when we look back a couple chapters in Proverbs to another very similar statement in Proverbs 15. I think this will make a lot more sense uh, with what he's trying to communicate. In Proverbs 15, Verse 8, he says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. Now, Hopefully, that helps make a little more sense. In John MacArthur's study notes on this verse, he wrote, External acts of worship, though according to biblical prescription, are repulsive to God when the heart of the worshiper is wicked. You see, what Solomon is teaching the Proverbs is that the, is that the wicked ignore God and turn away from him, whereas the righteous listen to God and run to him. But if you ignore God and you reject his word and you try to do these holy things, God says, no, I want your heart. If you come to me in prayer, but your heart is not with me, if you come and worship me, but your heart is not with me, 
if you go through the rituals of, of, uh, of Christian practice, but it's not from the heart, it's worthless to me. In fact, it's much worse, isn't it? It's an abomination. See, that's where we have other similar statements in the Scripture that God wants the sacrifice of the heart. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. And so the, the writer of the Proverbs recognized that, that if we are acting in a contrary way to the Word of God and rejecting God's Word, God doesn't listen to us. So far, the things that hinder our prayers are, are doubt, neglect, selfish motives, or, or praying that is contrary to God's word. And next, turn to Psalm 66. Psalm 66. Look at verse 16. Psalm 66, verse 16. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity, or if I had cherished sin, in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So the, the, the next reason that our prayers can be hindered is if we have unconfessed or cherished sin. This is such a, a beautiful passage in it, but the verses 16 through 17 at least. I mean, listen to the heart of the psalmist as he calls on God's people to fear God and be blessed, to sing praise to him and receive mercy. But in the midst of this lofty praise of God's steadfast love, the psalmist reminds us of the consequences of our sinful behavior. If we cherish sin, if we cling to it, God will not listen to our prayers. Maybe this reminds you of a passage that we saw on a Sunday morning at the end of January in Hebrews chapter 12. In verse 1, we read, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so, so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Rather than cherishing sin, rather than clinging to the things in our old way of living, let us lay aside those weights. Let us cast them aside. Or as the Apostle Paul wrote to the Colossians in chapter 3, verse 5, he said, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And then he lists a variety of sinful deeds. And he says that we are to put off the old. And we are to put on the new. Throw away the clothes of the old man and put on the garments of grace. Don't cling to sin. A heart that doesn't repent will not be heard by God. And then lastly, the Apostle Peter gives us a wonderful but very practical illustration. Turn to Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. And here we see that Family discord can cause your prayers to be hindered. I go back to the back of your New Testaments. So you got Hebrews, James, and then you have the two letters of Peter. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. The beginning of chapter 3, he talks to wives, and he gives instructions about the home, just uh, very similar to some of the words that the Apostle Paul gave to the Ephesians. But here, we're just going to focus on the husbands in verse 7, of Hebrews 3, verse 7. But that's why the word likewise is there, because he's already given instruction to the wives. So husbands, likewise live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, we're not, we're not going to take the time tonight to go through the God-ordained roles and relationships of a husband and wife. That'd be a wonderful Bible study, and I've done that, obviously, many times in the past, and, and I'm sure I'll do it again. But for tonight, for now, just notice the impact 
that sin has on a man's relationship with God. Men, when we do not regard our wife in the way which God has commanded, and we disregard the way that God has designed her, then our prayers can be hindered. Men, we have very clear instruction, don't we, on how we are to love our wives. The Apostle Paul, you've heard me preach on this so many times. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5 said that we are to love our wives in the same way that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her. Men, when we stop dying to ourselves, when we place ourselves in importance above our wife, when we insist on our needs as being more important than her needs, then we are in danger of having our prayers hindered. Now, I realized while writing this Bible study that I, it was getting very heavy and, and almost depressing. You may even by this point have begun to wonder, will God ever hear me pray? I doubt. There's sins that I cling to. There's, there's times I don't love my wife like I should. There's times I disregard God's clear commands. Will God ever listen to me? Maybe you're wondering that. Well, let's go back to Psalm 66. Some of you may have kept reading, and you were wise to do so. I stopped because I wanted to come back to it at this point. Psalm 66 again. I'm going to read the verse 18 again that we saw, but then look at verse 19. Verse, Psalm 66, verse 18. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart. So, oh, let's just back up to verse 16, because it's such a beautiful uh, paragraph or section of this psalm. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. God hears the prayers of his children when we trust in him and not doubt, when we hear his word and seek to put it into practice, when we confess our sin and humble ourselves before him, he hears us because, he is of, because of his steadfast love through his son, Jesus Christ. You see, he doesn't hear your prayers because you're a good person. Because you've cleaned yourself up. There will never be a day that you don't have some sin within your life. At least while we're on this earth. There will never be a week where you didn't face some doubt of some kind, where you didn't trust God and exercise faith. There will always be any one of these six hindrances in your life to prayer. So what's the answer? God's steadfast love through Jesus Christ. He listens to your prayer when you are repentant, when you trust in him, when you have a broken and contrite heart. He hears us because he has placed his steadfast love upon us through Jesus Christ. Through Christ, as we have seen repeatedly in the book of Hebrews, through Christ, we can go directly to the Father and know that we are heard. May the God of grace grant you his grace as you seek to follow him and grow in your love for him and his word. Next week, Lord willing, as we get closer to Easter, we're going to consider another essential to enduring this lockdown as castaways. And again, let me remind you, next week, I, I'm going to do a marathon of these. I don't know if I'm going to make it through all of them. I'm going to try my best, and hopefully the Lord will grant me the, the, the wisdom to be able to bring enough of these to you to encourage you. But Wednesday night, we'll have another one of these uh, castaway Bible studies, another 
means of grace that God has given to us for our growth and edification, even during days of, days of isolation. But then after Wednesday night comes Thursday, and Thursday is Monday, Thursday next week. And Lord willing, we will I'll have a devotion for you on, on one of the I am statements of Christ. And then I'm going to do a Good Friday devotion as well. Normally, we don't have a Good Friday service because we emphasize Monday, Thursday here and, and the Lord's Supper. But having just had the Lord's Supper on, on, this, on Sunday, on Palm Sunday, we're going to, I'm just going to do a devotion on, on uh, Monday, Thursday, and then a devotion on Good Friday. And then early Sunday morning, I'll upload a, a sunrise service for you. So get up early. Uh, it'll be a devotion again on one of the I Am statements of Jesus. And then we'll worship together virtually on Easter morning. Uh, as we celebrate the resurrection with a great I am statement of Jesus when he said at the tomb of Lazarus to one of Lazarus's sisters, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. So let's come together next week as we uh, worship together and as we study the word of God together uh, four days uh, next week, Lord willing, virtually. Uh, but let's go to him in prayer and give thanks once again tonight. All right, Heavenly Father, we do pray that you will uh, hear us through your son. And Lord, again, I lift up my brother to you. Lord, I pray that today will have been a wonderful day of rest for him, that his strength will begin to be renewed more and more with each passing hour. And Lord, I pray that the nausea uh, will finally cease, that he'll be able to regain his strength through some food. Uh, and Lord, that you would uh, enable him to have a restful night uh, where he, uh, again, even tomorrow would be better than he was today. Lord, thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. Thank you that your mercies truly are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.